As pointed out in the first video, to some extent, all teachers are managers. One of a teacher manager's most important concerns is making sure that students are motivated to behave responsibly and do quality work in the classroom. In this video, John Irwin will explain how his classroom of choice ideas relate to students' needs and motivation. He will also talk about relationships and why they are an essential part of the teaching and learning process. Now let's watch as John introduces himself and his approach to a group of teachers and administrators in Louisville, Kentucky. Good morning. I want to thank Glenna for the opportunity to be here and the leadership team that, that brought me here. Um, it's great to be here in Louisville, even though I'm from Buffalo. Uh, since I had to learn how to say Louisville, I would like you to learn how to say Buffalo the correct way. Please repeat after me. Buffalo. Buffalo. There you go. You want some wings? Come to Buffalo. All right. So <laughs> I'm from near Buffalo. I didn't grow up there. I grew up in... Uh, in upstate New York, the, uh, the Finger Lakes District, where they make some pretty good wine, and, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful area. Um, I taught uh, in a very small rural district uh, about 15 miles south of Ithaca, New York, the home of Cornell. But 15 miles away from Cornell, it's about a million miles away from that kind of culture. Uh, it was a very poor rural, rural district, 73% free and reduced lunch. Um, the first thing that they did uh, for new teacher induction was to take us on a bus ride around the district to see where our students lived. And it was an eye-opener for me. Uh, you know, I, Appalachia is not just Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and so forth. Uh, Appalachia reaches all the way up into Maine, and my students were, were from a the Appalachian culture. Uh, again, some, some kids didn't have any dirt, didn't have floors in their home. They had dirt floors, no running water, and that kind of thing. So motivation was a very important to me, trying to get these kids to be motivated to learn, to stay in school, and hopefully to go on to college. Uh, it was when I learned Dr. Glasser's ideas of choice theory in a basic intensive week one summer that transformed my classroom from a place that was pretty traditional, pretty, you know, it, I, I didn't have problems in the classroom. I mean, it was just, it was just kind of okay. You know, the kids came, they did what they were asked to do, uh, lots of B's and C's, not a lot of excitement in the classroom. I wanted, you know, I tried to get that excitement. excitement. Every teacher, when they go into teaching, they think that they're going to be uh, like the teachers in uh, To Sir With Love in my generation or uh, uh, Freedom Writers in, in this generation. And you get in there and you realize this isn't going to be as easy as I thought. Um, so, but when I learned these ideas, brought them back to my classroom, they transformed the classroom into a place that was just kind of B's and C's and you know, everybody kind of got along to a place it was I couldn't wait to get to in the morning. And the students, first our, our relationships got better, then the motivation to be in the classroom and to be engaged got better, and finally, uh, gradually, the, the quality of the performance I got from my students was, was uh, just beyond my wildest expectations. So I've, I've learned this, I've lived it, and it, it does work, uh, and it's working in classrooms all over the country in, in places like Louisville where you have a care for kids kind of uh, philosophy. So it's great to preach to the, to the choir because I've already read the document and I was really impressed. I said, wow, you don't really need me here, but okay, I'll come anyway. Um, so I'm really glad to be here in Louisville and look forward to the day. Uh, my my uh, teaching background was 7 through 12 English, uh, and, but I've been working with elementary and primary uh, teachers for many years now and I, I, I got it on the developmental level too. So anyway, uh, the topic today is motivation and it's how to appeal to intrinsic motivation in the classroom, and it's giving kids what they need and then getting what we want. And what we want, I'm assuming, is high quality learning, student engagement, and responsible behavior. And by giving people what they need, uh, you do get what you want. And it's not gonna make the classroom a perfect place, but it makes the classroom a better place for everybody. Okay, um, so the day is going to be Experiential, um, which is going to be a little discomforting at times because we're going to have to do some furniture moving at times to do some of the activities uh, that are in the book. But it's going to be learning experientially uh, management and instructional strategies that uh, increase students' motivation to learn and behave responsibly. Uh, so we, we're going to experience some of the strategies, as many as we can fit in, and we need some content to experience these strategies around, and the content is going to be motivation. Um, we're going to be looking at intrinsic motivation. That's really the, the umbrella for the day. 
But we're going to be looking at uh, some research on the motivation continuum. Uh, it was done by DC and Ryan, a couple researchers from the University of Rochester. Uh, we're going to be looking at what the five components of intrinsic motivation are. And they are Glasser-based, uh, Glasser the five basic needs uh, that William Glasser developed as part of choice theory. Um, we're going to be looking at your internal profile, that we all have all five of the basic needs, but we have them in varying degrees. And that helps explain um, how our personalities differ. Um, we're going to be looking at the school and classroom hierarchy of the needs, and then finally look at the implications of all of this stuff to instruction and management. We, we have to start off with some essential questions. Uh, understanding by design tells us. So here are our essential questions for today. What is intrinsic motivation? Why focus on intrinsic motivation when we can uh, go back and focus on the behaviorist approach, which is external motivation? Uh, what are the components of intrinsic motivation? And then how can we appeal to intrinsic motivation in the classroom? OK, you know the three rules of real estate? Location, location, location. Um, I moved a couple of years ago, and uh, I travel a lot, obviously. And uh, I have a, a wife and a 20-year-old son and a 7-year-old stepson and a 2-and-a-half-year-old daughter. So my traveling puts a lot of pressure on my wife. She's home alone right now with, well, two kids. One's in college. Um, and uh, we wanted to move to a place where she would have more support when I travel. So location, location, location. So we moved to Lockport, New York from Corning. Um, and uh, the reason for that was, was the location. We're now a block away from my sister-in-law. <laughs> and 10 minutes from my mother-in-law, which is good. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, so there, th that was the reason that we moved, the location. Now, um, there are three rules of, of education that are quite often uh, ignored. Uh, that a lot of people don't know about, and even when they do know about them, they, they focus, the focus is on uh, performance, 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 assessment, assessment, assessment. And we sometimes forget about these three most important rules of education, which are relationships, relationships, relationships. Now, as I said, I read the, the Care for Kids document, so I know you're, you know this already, but uh, I can't emphasize this enough, that the, the most important thing in education is the relationship, not just between the students and the teacher, though that's, that's critical, but at all levels, uh, relationships between teachers, among teachers, the relationship between the, the leaders and the teachers, between the teachers and the parents, uh, at all levels. And, and, and there was a study done um, and it was published in a book called Trust in Schools by Brick and Schneider, or Breich, I think it is, and Schneider, um, in, the, in their book, Trust in Schools. And what they said was, what they discovered was that trust is, is a commodity in a school district, just like money, like technology, like uh, staff development, uh, textbooks, and so forth. And th they, what they found is you can have all, all the same other um, resources in a school district, money and, and, and textbooks and technology and so forth. But if trust isn't there, it's going to have a huge negative impact on student achievement. But in schools where trust is there, it doesn't really matter about the other resources. It's nice to have those other resources, but if you have trust, you can have a huge impact on student achievement. OK, uh, since the three rules of, of education are relationships, 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 we need to, I get to, need to get to know you a little bit. and, and You'll get to know me throughout the day. Uh, but here's an activity that you can use with students, and we'll, we'll do, uh, I'll do with you just to get to know who's in the room a little bit better. This is called That's Me. How it works is this. I give a cr criteria, and if the cr criteria fits you, you stand up and say, with enthusiasm and energy, that's me. <laughs> Does that sound like fun or what? <laughs> OK, so you need to move your chairs back so you can stand up without hurting anybody. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> because everybody's going to be standing up on the first criteria. We do guided practice. Um, so like a good teacher, I have to model the behavior that I'm looking for in my students. So uh, I might give a criteria like, is follically challenged? That's me. OK, so that's how, how it works. Uh, so here's the first one. This is guided practice. If you are a, an employee of the Jefferson County Public Schools, please stand up and say, that's me. That's me. <laughs> Excellent. OK, uh, if you are a teacher, stand up and say, that's me. That's me. <laughs> Excellent. If you're uh, a principal, please stand up and say, that's me. That's me. 
Okay. Uh, counselors. Oh, that's me. <laughs> other. If you're not a teacher, principal, or counselor, okay, no, no others. Um, let's see. If you are, have been in the, the, the field of education for between one and five years, stand up and say. That's me! Ah, oh, they still have such enthusiasm. <laughs> okay. Six to ten. That's me! Did you notice a little less enthusiasm? <laughs> Eleven to fifteen. Hang in there. <laughs> uh, 16 to 20. That's me. <laughs> A little tired sounding. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, over tw 20 or over? 20 or over? That's me. Oh, please, please remain standing. Let's give them a hand. Right. <laughs> They're looking pretty good and they still have it. That's great. Okay, <laughs> education is a healthy field. It really is. It's a healthy field to be in. It's meaningful and it gives us, uh, it, meaningful work gives us healthier lives. Okay, uh, let's see. Have children of your own. That's me! <laughs> All right, this stuff applies to your children as well. Uh, have pets. That's me! Find your pets irritating at times. That's me! <laughs> we have two new kittens and, and uh, uh, they're great until about five in the morning when they want to climb in your face and say, you know, pet me. Uh, anyway, okay, do we have any other criteria? I think that's it. Okay, that's me. The next thing we're going to do, so you can do that with kids on the first day of school and, and change the criteria to fit, fit them. Uh, and it gets them to, uh, to see, you know, kids that have things in common with them and, and gets them moving, uh, moving a little bit. Uh, anytime you can get kids moving around in the classroom is a good thing because they're sitting so much of the time. Um, okay, now I passed out some cards. Uh, everybody has a, a playing card. And what I'd like you to do is find the person, a person at your table who has the same color card that you, oh, you didn't get a card? Um, is she coming? This one. You could be an ace. Would you pass this back? What I'm ask, going to ask you to do is, when I say go, find the person at your table who has the same color and value that you have. So if you have an ace or a, a red ace, you're going to be looking for this other person who has the red ace at your table. Now, there are, good, there are several cases where there are three people from your team here. So you're going to be a triad. Okay, so you'll be a triad. Everybody else will be a partner. And what I'd like you to do is interview your partner, find out their name and what they like to be called. That may be, you know, news to you. You may find out that somebody's always been wanting to be called Lola. And to, you know, now you, you find out for the first time. Um, find out what they like to be called. Find out where they work and how long they've been there. Uh, and one other thing about them that you wouldn't know just by looking at them. So this is where the new stuff comes in. Uh, you probably already know their name and, and where they work, because <laughs> you work with them. Um, but find out one other thing about them that you wouldn't know just by looking, looking at them. For example, I might say, um, mm, I have another book coming out in April. Uh, or I might say something like, I have a, a two-year-old daughter named Lena, and she's the most perfect little princess in the whole world. And perfect in every way. Um, <laughs> and I'll show pictures. Uh, so something interesting about them. And then we're going to do an activity where you're going to be going around and milling around and introducing yourself to other people, meeting other people, because you know, it's, we want to uh, make new friends and keep the old, because you know, one is silver and the other is gold. So uh, we're going to be making some new friends. So uh, take about oh, three and a half minutes to interview your partner, find out uh, their name, what they like to be called, where they work, how long they've been there, and one other thing you wouldn't know just by looking at them. So take about three minutes and interview your partner. I'm going to beach. So the beach is probably if I can retire. Have it up here. Um, heights. Heights. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is an activity called musical circles. Here's how it works. Uh, I'd like you to join yourself to the hip to your partner or group of three. Not, not literally, but stay with your partner. And when the music starts playing, I'd like you to just move around the room randomly. Just use the whole space. With your 
with your partner. Stay with your partner or a group of three. Uh, move around the room randomly. When the music stops, freeze and wait for further instructions. <laughs> okay? I'm going to have you introduce yourselves to another, some other people. Okay, so the, are the directions clear? Okay, I'm hoping my iPod will, will hang in there long enough to do this activity. As soon as the music starts playing, start moving. If you feel the urge to dance, feel free. Okay, freeze. Find another pair or group and join with them. If you don't have another pair, please raise your hand or another group. We have a table for two or, or three over here. There you go. Two or three. Table. Anybody else? Um, maybe you guys could join this group and be a. It does sound like a good one. <laughs> Okay, with your uh, group, inter uh, introduce your partner to the rest of the group. Does anyone need more time? Okay, we're going to do it again. So this time, when the music stops, freeze and find a different group or pair to, to, to work with. So on your mark, get set, dance. Can you say I have a kid Keep moving around. Okay, find We're another here. pair or group. Sure. Raise your hand if you don't have a pair or group. Anybody need a, a partner or a group to, to introduce? There they are. Do you have just the three of you? You need another you need another triad. Come on over. <laughs> okay, do it again. Don't forget to introduce your partner and uh, don't forget to leave out the other thing you wouldn't know just by looking at them. That's the best stuff. <laughs> Okay, take another five five minutes or so, three or five. It's the principal at our school, and um, she's been there for about three and a half, four years. And one thing you wouldn't know by looking at her is that she's moved 25 times. Wow. <laughs> and this is Sydney, and Sydney is a fabulous teacher. Um, she teaches fifth grade right now, and aspires very soon to be a librarian, which we're thrilled about. And you would not know by looking at her that she's a twin, and afraid of heights. And we don't want to forget heights. Emily. Oh. Emily is the instructional coach at Miners Lane, also absolutely fabulous, and she aspires to be a principal. And the thing that you wouldn't know about her is that she was, well, I, said, I just remember the fear of claustrophobia. That's, that's used, good. Well, she had a chicken as a child. As a pet. It's a pet. But it wasn't allowed in the house. No. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, when the music plays, please dance back to your seats or walk, whatever you like to do. Okay. Say goodbye. <laughs> One of the best benefits of attending staff development like this is getting to know new people, uh, sharing ideas, sharing strategies, and we will have an opportunity to do that today. Uh, you, and, and I know educators are, are very happy about giving ideas, uh, sharing strategies that they've used with their students that have been successful, and you can pick up some of the best nuggets you pick up today might be from other teachers. Uh, I want to just draw your attention to the, some of the strategies that I've already used that, that you can take back to the classroom. Starting off with a quiet signal. 
Uh, normally, in my classroom, I had a bell tree, which is a, a set of uh, bells that are, start off big and go in descending order, and when you ring it, you've, you've heard them before. They, they sound like uh, ring, and uh, it's, it's one of those things that they used uh, in the talking books to say, turn the page, you know, ring, turn the page. Uh, I use that in the classroom, and uh, now when I travel, I don't want to carry that big thing around. I just use the, the bell. Um, so that's a quiet signal. Now, quiet signals don't have to necessarily be a bell. They can be just a hand raised. I don't know, some, some teachers use the <laughs> clapping thing, but it's good to have something like that. Um, one teacher I know, he, he, his students know, he's a uh, high school chemistry teacher, his students know that when he sits in the big chair, it's time to get quiet. <laughs> um, so it's having something like that to let kids know it, it's time to settle in and, and focus. Uh, we did the That's Me activity. Uh, partnering people with cards uh, is a strategy that I use a lot. Um, usually what I'll do in a group like this is I'll pass out the cards at, at random and say sit, with a table, uh, sit at a table with people who have the same value that you have. And that mixes people up. Uh, you came in teams, so I didn't want to disrupt your teams today. I wanted to keep you, keep you there, so I didn't use it that way. But, uh, you know, I learned early on in my career that cooperative learning was one of the most effective research-based strategies uh, that, there, that there is. Uh, it's got more research behind it than almost any other best practice. And then I tried it in the classroom, and it was very frustrating to me. Because when I'd say, okay, get with a group of, get with a partner or a group of four, who would the kids get with? Their friends. How much work gets done? Very little, if any. Uh, because they have so much else to talk about when they're working with their friends. So I learned that if I partner them with somebody who's just an acquaintance, they're more, gonna be more likely to stay on task because they don't have so much other stuff to talk about. Um, and and the, it's maybe a little socially uncomfortable, so they, they focus on the task. The other problem with, uh, with cooperative learning that I experienced was accountability. Uh, they have, you have the, the, what, what I call the hogs and the logs in the group. The hogs who do all the work and the logs that are happy to let the hogs, you know, the logs that let the, are happy to let the hogs do all the work. <coughs> and uh, so that you can use the cards to increase accountability too. You, it's similar to the popsicle strategy that some of you probably know about, where uh, every kid's name is on a popsicle and you just at random pull one out of a, a cup. Um, this is a little like that. Uh, you have a second deck of cards and the kids know that after you've given them a task or a question to answer at their tables, that you're gonna pull a card at random out of the deck and the kid who has that card has to answer. So even if, the, if they were a log and we're kind of sitting back, not doing anything for five minutes, they see you pull out the deck of cards, they'll turn into the table and say, what should I say? Because they don't want to look embarrassed, they don't want to be embarrassed in front of their peers. So they'll learn something in at least that last one minute before you pull the card out. So that's, that's a, another strategy you can use to increase accountability. Um, the musical circles can be done in, in pairs like we did it, or groups the, the way we did it, or it could be just done individually where you have kids mill around the room until the music stops and then turn to a partner and maybe do a drill and practice on a, on a, a flash card or answer a, a question uh, and keep, keep doing it until they've reviewed a whole bunch of uh, information. That could be used to uh, have kids uh, uncover prior knowledge. What do you know about this topic before you, you get going, have them do some mus musical circles a few times and, and learn about from each other something about the topic that you're gonna cover. It could be a drill and practice activity where they, again, they, they, uh, they uh, drill each other on the, on the card that they have and then they switch cards and move again and switch cards and move again and switch cards and move again. So they've all uh, been accountable for a whole bunch of inf information in a short period of time. Or it could be a review activity. So there's some a musical circles activity. In this video, John has shown us how to get students involved and engaged in learning. The techniques that John demonstrated work because they meet students' basic psychological needs. In the next video, we'll learn more about these basic needs and see how they relate to motivation in a classroom of choice.